Hi everyone, it's Alex from Risk Academy and today I wanted to talk about heat maps or risk matrices for that matter. My favorite, everyone's favorite topic and uh, I wanted to lead by example and share my story how I have evolved from using heat maps to avoiding them like plague. So here's the story. I was, um, I was uh, signed up to be the head of risk of one of the sovereign funds in, uh, in, in Russia. And the reason why I was invited to kind of to lead that function was because external auditors, state auditors, um, prosecution office and quite a few other organizations, including some of the board members, have complained that, you know, surely for a sovereign fund there should be some proper risk management in place. Yes, it's private equity. Um, yes, it's relatively immature field in terms of risk management compared to some of the other financial investment types. Um, still, there should be internal audit, there should be risk management. That was the kind of the, the position. And hence, I joined as the head of risk of the sovereign fund. So I had pretty much an open slate to do anything I wanted. So I went through an evolution. And that evolution actually taught me a very, very valuable lesson. But to be honest, that actually took two years. It took me two years to get to where I am now in terms of my thinking on risk um, risk analysis. So here's how I've done it. And some of the some of the people watching the YouTube channel wanted case studies. Well, this is a case study of how I have actually done it in the company where I worked. So year one, or shall we say it, year zero, and uh, we have an, a portfolio of uh, 95 plus minus uh, investments. Most of them are private equity, some of them are funds, uh, some of them are venture capital investments, um, and they're all over the world. Pre de pre predominantly in Russia, but really there are a few international investments as well, so with all the logistical issues associated with that. So I come from a consulting background, so immediately I think, what a brilliant idea. I'm going to write a methodology which, create, which basically will help each of the investment teams looking after those 95 portfolio companies to come up with a risk profile. So we will build a risk profile for each investment. Risk profile being a heat map and the risk register. So year zero, I have created the methodology. I have created a risk taxonomy, a checklist, a very simple, straightforward methodology. And I sent it out to all the, uh, all the teams. Uh, I have provided them training how to apply the methodology, but I wasn't really involved in the actual workshopping, interviews, discussion type, um, discussion type things. So this is basically, you know, this was as basic as you can get, and um, the result, we had each of the 95 um, portfolio companies was risk assessed, and an overall risk profile was created for each one. And we were able to determine which investments fall under the bucket of high risk, which investments fall under the bucket of low and medium risk. Yeah, again, very simplistically. Um, this was kindergarten, kindergarten stuff. So I was lucky that we connected that process with a, a semi-annual stress testing that was happening on the portfolio anyway. So basically, these risk assessments, these this risk profiles would be updated at least every six months. So first six months, year zero, I've given the methodology, I've trained the people, and they've done everything themselves. Uh, that, I mean, that actually turned out pretty well, I thought at the time. That turned out pretty well because historically, all the, all the 95 portfolio companies have been ranked in terms of risk, low, medium, high, but there wasn't really any methodology behind it per se. So most of the, most of the companies were low or medium risk. Well, after we first done that exercise, it turned out that quite a few of those investments that we believed to be low risk uh, were actually high risk. So our portfolio has significantly reshaped in terms of its uh, overall risk profile. And I thought that was pretty exciting. And uh, the CEO thought that was exciting. The internal audit thought that was very exciting. So then six months go by. It's, it's a time for our second risk assessment, second update of those, uh, of those heat maps. Uh, by now, I um, got to know some of the teams. I, I realized that not everybody is as competent or as honest um, as uh, I initially believed. So I thought, 
I'm a good risk manager, so I'm going to do an amazing job. And next six months, so it's year zero, next six months, the second, uh, second update, I will actually sit down with each of the teams and we have the same methodology, we have updated it, we have updated the checklist because we've learned a lot of interesting things on new projects. Um, we have our new checklist, we have our new risk taxonomy, we've slightly updated the methodology, uh, we've polished you know, any inconsistencies and I actually sat down with every single team out of those 95 portfolio companies, investment teams, to make sure we updated the, um, the heat map. And then something, something quite interesting happened. As I was speaking to the people, I actually got to flesh out a lot more details and realized that not all the risks were initially, um, initially properly assessed, not, a lot of things were missed or ignored completely. Um, and even though the kind of the portfolio still stayed relatively high risk, but some of the medium, medium risk projects again turned to high risk projects. So there was a lot more detail. Uh, and I was, I was really, really proud of myself. I thought by sitting down, by facilitating, by actually getting involved, I really significantly improved the value of our overall risk uh, profile for the fund. And so I was really excited at the time. Then the next six months pass. And it's another opportunity to update um, e each of the project risk profiles. And by that stage, I've learned a lot. I actually made a lot of friends in the back office. I had uh, connections and good contacts and good key stakeholders in finance, legal, in our scientific department, in um, monitoring and strategy department, and literally all of the back office, uh, back office business units. Uh, Internal Audit has actually done a lot of work until then, and uh, we were able to use a lot of their findings that they put in the reports to give us more insight, provide better information into the risk profiles. So what we have done the third time, so it's, it's now year not zero, but year one, and um, one year passed, and we're trying to, again, update those risk profiles. So what we have done is we have sat down with every single team, just like we did the second time. However, now I've implemented the procedure with the help of my friends from monitoring and strategy. I've implemented the process, which we called verification. And that's where, for whatever risks the business teams have identified, back office departments, legal would, would, legal would validate the legal risks, finance would validate the financial risks, um, strategy and mon monitoring, performance monitoring would validate some of the marketing and market risks, internal audit would validate how does the risk perception of the team correlates with their findings because they've actually been on the ground and they've seen most of those 95 companies by that stage. And that again changed the picture quite dramatically. Um, you know, most of the risks still, and for some bizarre reason, I mean, that's a coincidence, um, but that unfortunately happens more often than not, is that it's, it's only deteriorating. Like, it's, it's not like we have discovered, oh no, this project is actually not a high risk. That was a low risk and we can relax um, and we should have been relaxed all along. No, it's actually every single time there would be more in the buckets of high, high risk. So we fleshed out so much more information. We fleshed out a lot more details and I was on top of the world. I was so excited. Uh, we've implemented the procedure where there's live ongoing verification of whatever the business units see as key risks. And that really improved our overall risk profile, in, in, improved not the risk profile in terms of the level of risk, but improved in terms of the clarity and reduced the uncertainty. Also, I felt at the time, and uh, and then the whole thing just collapsed, collapsed, and it, it exploded. Because what happened was, at, you know, for years I have been trying to implement Monte Carlo simulations and proper scenario analysis and proper decision trees into the actual risk analysis for those investment projects. And by that stage, I happened to convince both the CFO and some of the investment directors that for high ticket items, for very significant high risk projects, we should get a chance to model some of those risks and actually see not just whether it's high, medium or low, but actually see how much those risks 
affect the project deliverables, the NPVs, the IRRs, the expected returns and, and payback periods, and literally anything else that is important for, for that project. So we've picked a pilot. We've picked one pilot, which was a high risk, which, which was on our radar for ages. It was a high risk. Um, you know, it was a high risk overall. The heat map looked like with a lot of risks in the red. Nobody had any illusions about the riskiness of the project. It was a very, very significant risk. But then a miracle happened because we started testing different scenarios. We started, well, we used Monte Carlo simulation, but what we tried to do is we tried to test different scenarios. Well, what will happen if the foreign exchange increases? And in fact, soon later, it did increase because uh, Russia went onto a lot of sanctions and the, the uh, ruble just collapsed 130%. Um, what will happen if uh, interest rates in the country have significantly changed? And again, in fact, they're almost doubled uh, so, soon after we've, uh, we've done the analysis. And uh, um, what will happen if uh, the team is successful or not very successful in upgrading the, um, the technology that was used for generating, um, for, for generating solar panels? And by the way, that was a solar uh, generation type business, one of the biggest in, uh, in Russia. Um, and uh, we, we've test we, we started testing those things. What will happen if foreign exchange changes and interest rates go up and the technology um, modification, modernization is delayed and few other significant risks? So we basically took the heat map that we always had, but we tried to start, we started analyzing what will happen to the business if some of those risks eventuate and how much um, buffer or protection does the business balance sheet have to sustain some of those, uh, some of those risks. And that's when things got real. That's when we moved away from just saying there are five high risks on the heat map in the red and they should be mitigated as soon as possible. That's when things got very real. Because as soon as we started modeling even some of those scenarios, we realized that the company is actually going to go bankrupt in one and a half years. And not only is it going to go bankrupt, if the company wanted to not just make money but recover some of the initial investment, the government or some of the investors would actually have to fork out significant millions of dollars of extra funding just to keep the business afloat. Because the way legislation was structured at the time did not allow the revenue to correlate with the cost. So the costs have significantly increased. And everybody, again, everybody realized the costs have increased. But nobody really tested those scenarios to realize but how much impact that would have. So that was that was a pretty fascinating experience because normally, you know, you model 10,000, 20,000 scenarios and it gives you a distribution of different results. So we've modeled 10,000 scenarios and the distribution looked like a single value. In every single scenario that we've tested, the outcome was the company value was zero. That basically means the company was going to go bankrupt. And uh, in fact, we were able to model but exactly when it's likely to go bankrupt unless things have significantly changed, unless the strategy have changed. We've also modeled how much money would need to be invested more on top of the existing investment by the, by the government and, and the co-investors to save the company. And we've also modeled if the team were to hedge some of the risks, were to moder modernize the, the plant and bring in new equipment from China instead of instead of Europe. So we've tested a lot of different scenarios. If the team were to do the best they physically could, the company is still not going to be saved. So that was that was a big, big difference between speaking there are high risks and they need to be mitigated and actually saying which of these risks have a very significant real impact on the business. By the way, by doing the Monte Carlo simulation, we've actually learned about the nature of that company and how it operates, because we had to understand very in-depth understanding, we had to get a very in-depth understanding of the model. By doing that, we've actually learned so much about the business, more than we have learned in the previous two years of working with that company. This is just how powerful quantitative risk analysis is, because it makes you get into, get into all the nitty-gritty details, get to learn the nature of the business, what makes it tick, how it makes money, what are the biggest cost drivers and so on. 
it's a very different again ball game compared to just talking about risks we're talking about business we actually had to understand the nature of the business explicitly not just talk about risks and, and so for me that was a revolution in thinking when I well everybody in the company knew the project was high risk nobody realized just how bad how critical the situation is also nobody realized that basically every single mitigation action that they've had for the last two years is not gonna work because it's not going to save the company the company was in such a bad shape that none of those mitigations that look all very reasonable and practical and again you know the investment team was specializing in solar generation they were very clever guys uh, and and girls and uh, um, none of that were gonna work and we, are, we realized that only after we've actually modeled all of those scenarios, we've tested all, the, all these hypotheses to realize it's just ne never going to fly. So that was an amazing experience because literally a week later in the newspapers, I saw how the CEO of the company was speaking to the Minister um, of Energy, lobbying and suggesting that uh, the tariff policy, the, the legislation, the local legislation in the country will have to change to reflect the changed nature of costs and the changed environment on the financial markets um, and uh, e eventually that is what happened so that was an amazing experience how heat maps provided the aura that something's not right but nobody was able to pinpoint just how not right it was and uh, really assess how mitigation plans are going to work or not going to work and then as soon as like literally the very second we did the quantitative risk analysis we've just had this amazing amount of insight that allowed us to make much better decisions and so no decisions were made for the first two years because risk management really didn't have anything valuable to contribute just to reiterate that yes risks are high um, and then literally the very second we've done proper risk analysis and we were able to quantify those risks and we were able to show how different scenarios may affect the actual company bottom line and how much money within of course 95% confidence interval how much money the investors will have to fork out to save the company that's when th everything just got very real so I encourage you give it a try you will be amazed just how much more ammunition you can bring to the decision makers by using quantitative risk analysis good luck write your comments and questions underneath this video don't forget to sign up to the Risk Academy channel on YouTube for now thank you and goodbye Thank you.